Okay. Um, this is Credit Card Networks 101, what they are and how to secure them. Um, I don't do public talks very often, so if I don't give you guys eye contact, deal with it. Um, this is in the 101 category, so I'm not going to be getting into crazy stuff like, <laughs> you know, here's your server, here's exactly how you get the numbers. So all of you that are interested in just getting a quick fix on the stealing credit card numbers, this might not be for you. Uh, it's got a very strong focus in the hospitality uh, industry, and that's because of two reasons. One, that's the most unsecure industry as far as credit card networks are concerned. And two, that's the one that I tend to deal with the most in uh, the corporation I work for. So with that said, any of you that didn't read my introduction, I'll start there. Uh, credit card networks have grown into a viable and necessary asset in large transaction-based businesses. All, are these networks protected? Are there formal security measures to protect these packets from external and internal threats? Most network administrators, controllers, CTOs, and CIOs are not even aware of credit cards' flow or existence on their networks, generally speaking. Further, some of these protect their network switches too much, and they disable the true functionality of credit card networks, causing a lot of problems and opening up a lot of exploits. So we're going to start off with uh, how credit card data gets to point A, from point A to point B in a credit card network. Uh, OK, so how does the flow of credit cards work? Does your card get swiped and then magically the money is removed from your account? Obviously not. Let's take a look into what's involved. In a nutshell, your full looks like this. Let me give you a quick flow chart here. You have uh, point of sale systems, property management systems that start here. So we'll call them property management systems. And since we're talking about. <laughs> Brighter color, okay, sorry. Uh, bigger? No, no bigger. Sorry, that's the best I got. Um, so you got your property management system, and in a credit card. In a credit card network, it's going to go directly to a central point. <laughs> point of sale. Darker? OK, I can just use hand visuals instead, if that would be better, you know? Um, pretty much back to blue. How about dark blue? OK, so these both connect into a master transaction engine. And pretty much what happens is it uses your existing network in most cases where they'll just take the packets of credit card data, swipe data and all, and they'll just swipe them in these systems and they'll go across your existing switches and whatnot to a master server. Master server then has either a dial out or lease line connection directly to the internet or directly to the front end processor and it gets authorization that way. So that's the very stripped down version of what a credit card network is. Um, the processor, credit cards don't go directly to a bank. All credit cards, they get authorized through an automated clearinghouse or a front-end processor, whatever you want to call it. And pretty much from the start of time, they didn't really organize it too well. It was just Diners Club and American Express. It was all in New York. So if you wanted to accept these clients' cards, you know, you just connect it directly to these networks. Well, they wanted to expand it out across the United States, and then they added other people like Visa and MasterCard and Traveler's Card, JCB. So what happens is you have all these merchant banks where they have to have the money withdrawn from their account and moved into, uh, or credit card issuers' banks that has to be moved into a merchant bank. So they created front-end processors, which is pretty much just somebody that literally gets paid to move money from point A to point B. So they have all the connections to all the issuing banks and all the connections to the merchants' banks, and all they do is just say, move his money from there to there. It also happens in a two-step process. The two-step process is the authorization and settle. For those of you who have debit cards where you have the cute little logo on your credit card, on your checking account, and you couldn't get a real credit card to tell, but yeah, I got a real credit card, but it's just your checking account, you might notice that you know if you don't like balancing your book or whatever, and you say, well, where's that money? Or, hey, how did I get overdrawn this money? because it first authorizes the money. It doesn't actually remove it. So what happens is if the merchant does not uh, remove the money out of your account in a timely manner, it just releases the authorization. And all of a sudden you think, hey, they forgot to charge me. I'll just get a free payday. And the next thing you know, you're overdrawn 200 bucks. So it has two steps. Authorize it first, settle it, settle it next. And so that's your two stages. So with the credit card network, what we got here, I was skipping around trying to catch up from that long speech. 
Uh, so with the credit card network, obviously it goes through there. So you can see some inherent problems when um, you're just using existing equipment, especially in the hospitality industry. So let's get into the inherent risks of what's all involved there. Uh, getting money using social engineering. Uh, if you have the right tools and uh, three-letter acronyms and everything, you can get what you need from merchants. Calling a hotel and say you're with an issuing bank and that you need a voice merchant account number of this site. Say, I'm with your bank. We have a problem. We want to make sure that this person who was charged was from your site. What's your merchant account number? And they say, oh, sure, no problem. I'll give that to you. And you need this to verify what you need from them. Okay. Um, uh, you can even give them the credit card number or a fake one or yours, you know, just to tell them, yep, see, I'm the one that has their credit card. Give me that money or give me that merchant account. So what you do with this is you have a merchant account, and this is the biggest, most prevalent problem in the credit card industry is actual credit card terminals. You've got transfer ADs, Verifones, Hypercom terminals. These are all very unprotected devices because you can go out on the Internet or on eBay and just buy a transfer AD uh, credit card terminal from anybody. And so with this merchant account number, if you know how to operate these transfer ADs and Omni 395s and Hypercoms, you just pretty much take that merchant terminal ID in there, punch it in there. That's now my terminal ID. And you call a front end processor and you say, hey, my terminal broke. I just bought a new one. I'm with X company. Can you, uh, you know, give me the password to re-download this terminal? So, you know, you might talk to X company in California and you live in New York and you just hit the button and you just download all of their data onto there. Now you have a full-fledged working credit card terminal sitting, you know, from your favorite phone booth down the street. And, uh, yeah, you just swipe a card and say, I want to credit them $300 hit close batch, and boom, you just gave yourself $300, and nobody knows what's going on, you know. And the accounting, accounting departments in hospitality networks, I've got to tell you, sometimes they don't, they reconcile, they don't balance, you know. At the end of the night, they just say, that looks good or whatever, and at the end of the month, they reconcile and say, oh, looks like we were short, what do we do? Well, it's too late. Everything was already pumped through. We don't know where it came from. Uh, getting money directly from the merchant. Another thing with hospitality networks, auditors get paid $750, Five fifteen, eight dollars an hour. They don't really care about their job. They're working a midnight shift because they have their other daytime job that they're going to to support whatever they got going on. So they're pretty much just get this problem fixed, move on to the next one. They don't pay attention whatsoever. So you go to your favorite hotel, you know, you stay there, you actually pay the money and everything. You have no problem with that. She decided I'm short on money this week. I want to get that money back. So you call them up and say, Hey, you double charged me when I was at your hotel. So what they'll do is they'll try and do research using their credit card software and everything. You know, this is beyond terminals. It's actual in front of you software. Well, fax me your statement proves to me that you took, got double charged on this because they'll dig through it and they won't be able to find it, paperwork or just a big, huge mess where they're not familiar with the software enough. So, you, you know, Photoshop, you know, you got two credits on your credit card statement and you printed it up, you know. And you send it in to them and everything like, oh, I can't find it here, but it appears that you have it on your statement. Maybe it was a bug in our system and it double charged you. That's why I can't see it. And then they just go ahead and send you a free credit, you know. A little bit of an issue there. And it does happen. And we actually have a story where um, somebody checked into a hotel from one of my clients. They swiped their card. It was declined. They said, well, okay, it's declined. We'll let you stay right now, you know, while you get that fixed. So they stayed for the three nights. And it was in a really expensive hotel. And uh, then what they did was they were like, well, they just bailed out on the check completely. They didn't pay. They just left. So it was $1,000 that the hotel was out of. Well, they didn't know how to operate their credit card software or their front desk software very well. So instead of just voiding out the transaction, they credited it $1,000. <laughs> Oops. And then we have our software here that's supposed to audit it, credit card network software. Inherent design is to make things simpler. You have 15 billion credit card terminals in your hotel or in your casino, and you don't want to have to go from door to door to door getting all these credit card receipts and everything. So it's all electronically stored. You just look at your list, look at what it's supposed to be. You like it, you hit close batch. Well, with these people, they didn't bother doing that. They hit close batch, gave them $1,000. Then they called us up afterwards and said, hey, I just gave them $1,000. And when I tried to recharge them, it said the account has been closed. So... Yeah, go figure. <laughs> so somebody out there is really happy with, you know, their new $1,000 hoopty. 
Okay, hacking from, uh, where are we at here? Hacking from inside the network. Uh, using shared networks, too often hotels boost. We have internet access in every room and Wi-Fi in the lobby. You can see where this is going. And not everyone realizes that they're giving their customers access to the same shared media as their credit cards. The latest craze in hotel networks, large and small, is high-speed internet, so they love to boast all this. And the internet hookups in every room. So the general point of attack here is going to be the lobby. You don't even have to check in. And you just sit there all day long with the port sniffer and you're just grabbing credit card numbers across their network, you know. So, and it is real and it has happened and we have had to reconcile, it, reconcile that quite a bit. And of course, you know, they don't put firewalls and it's just like FBI's carnivore for those of you who are familiar with that. And what's inside these packets, that's the important thing that people don't understand. Um, if you manually enter a card, it's no big deal. You just have, you know, 16 digit card number, expiration date, and a dollar amount. You know, you can do some damage with that, but if you try and, you know, card a laptop off the internet, you know, they want CVV2 information, they want address information, that kind of stuff. Well, with swipe data, you're literally getting what's off that magnetic strip. So when they swipe it at their front desk system and it goes across, you have magnetic data. And everybody that has any inclination what credit cards are know that that's pretty much the cherry bomb of what you want, you know. So let's get into oh, the rogue employee. Another thing that we run into with uh, credit card networks is that they're not very, they're very new. Not a lot of people know about them, and they're not very secure in a lot of situations. You see a lot of people who are just like, hey, we just have the vendor's password, username and password. Everybody in the whole entire hotel, you know, that deals with the credit cards remotely will just log in with these. So you're seeing a lot of remote exploits where ex-employees like, man, I hate that stupid company. It was bad, you know. And, you know, he has his little Uber friend. He's like, really? Well, what do you got over there? Well, we were always doing credit cards at night and everything, and they, we all use the same password. And he's like, really? Tell me more, you know. <laughs> So, you know, then he's like, well, you know, I'm doing my 60-hour a week, you know, engineering job, but I can squeeze 20 hours out of the week to just get a part-time job over there, you know. It's a pretty unsecured network. Nobody will ever notice. And uh, that one hasn't happened yet, but it can. Uh, also, this stuff is getting pretty cheap, so it, and it's pretty scalable. So you're going to have a lot of people who are, you know, five-bedroom motel who has their small credit card network, you know, and they got their hub and their links to switch. So uh, they're going across the internet, and the traffic's encrypted. It's, you know, 384-bit moving target and all that fun stuff. So when it's across the wire and everything, nobody can really grab it unless they know what they're doing and know what they're looking for. But they're connecting to the internet using a Linksys Soho router, you know. And uh, the same token, when they use that router, they offer their five bedrooms internet access, you know, going across the same thing. So that's another exploit that comes into play. What else you got here? Okay, what's involved with them reading the packet information? Let's say one of you guys knows what you're doing and you want to go out and test this. What are you looking for across your internet or across their network? Most common thing that uh, is the biggest problem, why these aren't secure, is because they're only supposed to be installed in trusted networks. And obviously we're talking about how even though they're supposed to be, they're not being installed. So how do you read the information out of them? Well, the scary thing is it's all ASCII, you know, going across. So, I mean, all you have to do is look, date, time, RX, card number, date, time, RX, amount to be authorized, date, time, card, RX, CVV2 code. It's literally all there in ASCII because when you're working with a property management solution or a point of sale solution, they're engineers are lazy, they don't want to have to plug this in, they don't want to use binary, they don't want to use secure tunnels, they don't want to take the time to actually make sure it's secure. So what they'll do is just say, well, let's create an API to your interface, but let's just make it a clear text API. That way we know we can't screw anything up, but there's something wrong. It's all clear text anyways, we can see where it's going wrong. And they'll do that. And there's over 80 point of sales and property management systems that all they do is ASCII right across the line. So that's pretty much all your clear text stuff there. Uh, let's see here. So the main point, obviously, is that this is a problem and it has to be resolved. So let's get into some ways to protect it from a credit card standpoint. Protecting from social engineering, we kind of touched base on that, how to protect yourself against that. It's pretty much, you know, if somebody calls in with their Photoshop statement 
what you really want to do is just call your merchant bank. Nobody wants to do that. Just call your merchant bank. Did they take it out twice? Yes, they did. Send the credit. No, they didn't. Okay, let's do some other research, you know. Uh, protecting your networks. Nobody uses, uh, they use ASCII. Nobody's using anything else. Uh, VPN solutions are pretty cheap these days. You know, all it would take is just installing a VPN between your inter two internal computers. Or hell, just be smart and get a managed switch, you know, and just, you know, that port only goes to that port. Don't let anybody else talk to that stuff. Easy enough. Um, social engineering on the card cloning side or the credit card terminal slide, it really can't be avoided too much because, you know, even the best, most secure person who's sure about their network, you know, will give away a terminal ID or it'll just be sitting in a dumpster and you guys can see how dumpster diving works later on today. Uh, it's all just still sitting there and you can't get around it. The only thing you can do is move to a credit card network and get off terminals. That's my biggest thing. Terminals, any of you, oh, you all got the CDs. So I left a lot of reference lists in my directory. You have a lot of uh, room to work with, find out which credit card networks are which, and the actual white papers and how to program your own transfer ADs, Omni 395s, 3300s, Hypercoms. It's all freely available on the internet for anybody who wants to be a developer of this stuff, so you can see exactly how it works and how to take all take over a credit card terminal. So that's pretty easy and straightforward. Okay, so what are the credit card companies doing about this? Well, they've knew a lot about it since uh, the ins it went really crazy with the debit cards back in the mid '90s, uh, but they didn't care. They just thought that it wasn't a big enough problem, so. It wasn't until 95, well, 99, 2000 that they started designing these. So you got Visa, who has their cardholder information security program. Theirs is uh, pretty much it's called the CISP audit, not to be confused with CISSP, it's CISP. Uh, it pretty much just gives you pretty lame stuff to digital dozen, you know, like, hey, only one person is supposed to be accessing your credit card network. Make sure that they are the only ones that has a password. Hey, make sure you have a business class firewall. Hey, make sure that you know the physical access to these terminals are limited and everything. And uh, if you really want to, like, you know, try and own somebody's credit card network, uh, just read through this and like the CISP one. And just go to Visa.com and read it, and then take everything that's there that says good practices, which are pretty much just like we suggest you should do these, and just believe that they ignored all of them intentionally because. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. So, you know, that's a good start for anybody who wants to find out how to actually get into these. Just read through that thing and it's like, wow, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. And they're not, you know. Um, also, these people, like small hotels, they have a big, huge thing with uh, connecting to cable modems and to DSLs. And anybody that knows cable modems, I don't know how good it is in your areas, but over here, you know, you can still see other people's Windows shared directories and everything across your cable modems. It's kind of lame, so you know you can still put a port sniffer on there for packet or packet sniffer and port sniff everybody out. And if you see like a weird port and you recognize it from one of these credit card companies' uh, ports that they use to send out encrypted traffic, you know you have a live one. And then you, of course you go through their Linksys router and just get into their network and then migrate across because the uh, the vendors themselves. I work for a vendor, so I'm going to go ahead and spin our wheel for a minute here. We uh, we do do a very good job of encrypting the traffic once it leaves our presence. Thing is, is that before it gets to us, it's not very secure, you know. So, I mean, we got moving target, two open source protocols, one closed source protocol. Who knows what it's coming across, you know? That's pretty secure going across the internet. Uh, but coming in, taking it over, that's another story. You can't really get around that. Um, also, Mastercard has their uh, site data protection one, so you can look up on that as well. And American Express has one. It's kind of hard to find, but it's out there. Um, unavoidable threats. We already went over that. So basically, um, I'm going to kind of wrap it up a little bit early here and open up for questions because I can't think of other stuff I should probably have mentioned. Uh, basically, uh, credit card networks, they're in everything, resale. Um, what else? Uh, hospitality, all that fun stuff. They're very insecure. Bring your Wi-Fi jacks out there and give them all day long. With that said, uh, any questions?
since I can't really remember anything. Yeah. 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 No, they don't. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, when somebody calls in and decides to be a social engineer and say, hey, uh, I need to get this credit on my, my statement reversed or this charge reversed to a credit, uh, do they take any information down about that caller? And the answer is no, they don't. The only information they take down is what's your credit card number? Honestly, uh, we're recording this. I've worked at call centers, and I work, uh, and our call center has, I'm sorry, what? Oh, the question was, this call is being recorded for quality assurance purposes. Do they actually record that call, and do they actually go back to the tapes? Uh, in my experience with call centers, working in different vendors besides this, no, they don't. They listen in on them, and like once a week, you're evaluated on a call you have taken. But for the most part, most of them are not recorded. They're purged after one week or a month. Yes, sir. Okay, the, regu the question was, what's the regulations on swiping cards versus stamping them? Speak up? Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, what's the policy on swiping cards what's the, and manual entries? Why do they have that? And what's that involved with it? Um, is that pretty much it? Well, the thing is, is that swiping a card... Um, ideally, when a merchant accepts the responsibility of accepting cards, they are supposed to train their staff on a couple basic points. Uh, check the ID of the person that is giving you this card. It's a mandatory thing no matter where you go. Even if you see these Visa commercials and everything that say, like, hey, here's our Visa logo. Now you don't have to give out five forms of ID. That's wrong. Anything that has a Visa logo, American Express logo, It, I understand that it says that, but um, automated clearinghouses and merchant service providers have a separate one, and it is actually a kind of a conflict of interest, you know. The merchant insurance and policy, exactly. Because they're going through an MSP, which is, you know, not the bank, not the clearinghouse, not the cardholder, but just some guy who knows it very well, and they just give him free money to just move money around somewhere else, you know. Uh, they say, like, because they're the ones that have to deal with chargebacks. You know, when a chargeback comes, it goes to the merchant service provider, not their direct bank. So they say, you know, we want to keep our chargebacks lower on these cards, so we require you to check ID on every card regardless. Okay. Um, as far as that's concerned, uh, swipe data, they tr believe that once you swipe a card, you have checked their ID, and you have compared it with them, and you've compared the name on the ID to the name on the card. And so since you compared all these and you swiped the card, which card physically means the card was there, so you got, I checked his ID, the card was physically there, everything checks out, that gives you the best chargeback protection. Now, if you sit there and go back and forth, back and forth, the card just does not want to read, they have to, now the discount rate, we didn't really talk too much about a discount rate. Discount rate is pretty much when you have, uh, what's my time, by the way? 14 minutes, okay. Uh, the discount rate is pretty much um, every card. If you ever go anywhere and they say debit or credit, always tell them credit if you have a debit card. Always tell them because debit, you get charged 59 cents to 250 for a transaction. Credit, the merchant themselves gets charged a percentage of that transaction. So if you have a $100 transaction and the average discount rate is 1.5%, you know, that's your discount rate breaking out. So... What happens is if it's 1.5% for a swiped card, check the ID, and you swipe the card, doesn't swipe, you got to manually enter it. That means you have to manually enter it in. That means the terminal does not know that the card was actually there. The discount rate skyrockets to 
mm, about 2.9 to 3 percent, depending on what your deals are. So how do you bring that discount rate back down? You manually imprint the card to say, yeah, it really was here. It just didn't read in the reader. And then another thing, yes. Okay. Another thing that they want is your zip code. Okay. You know, we need some personal information about this person. Get your zip code in there. That also lowers your discount rate for the merchant, so that way it saves them money. Any way they look at it, it's going to get down to maybe 2% if they have everything required. They entered the CVV2 code. They entered the, the zip code. They entered the last four digits of the credit card into the terminal again. Um, and they took the manual swipe. It'll probably get down to about 2.9, but not before. Or, no, sorry, 1.9. Yeah. Uh, possession of a swipe reader is, is the same thing as like possession of anything else, like a, a what do you call it, pirate radio. It's 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 right. The the only it's it's one of those another one of those like freedom of speech spiels. You know, it's you know, you know, I can have this big huge sword that I'm not supposed to have, but as long as it's on the wall, nobody cares. You know. In that sense, and also it's like, well, I have a pirate radio device that can propagate a signal like 15 million miles, you know. But as long as I don't turn it on and put it on and hijack somebody's frequency, I'm allowed to have it for hobby purposes. So it falls under the hobby rules. You're allowed to have it, but if you get caught doing bad things with it, you know, then of course, you know, you're looking at minimum. I believe credit card fraud is minimum 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anybody that knows. Uh, well, well, that also gets into the, uh, you know, found facts with the search. This search warrant was for that, or this bust was for that, and then we came across this. I, I think the law, you know, a good shiesty lawyer will take care of that for you. I'm sorry, what? Exactly, yeah, you know, and it actually works that way sometimes, too. Uh, who's next? You, sir? Uh, because here's the interesting thing about it, you know, uh, merchant service providers, it's a very dirty industry, you know. Um, they see it as, okay, who does all that fraud protection that wasn't swiped? We're talking about it wasn't swiped. We, the discount rate skyrockets. Who actually gets that money? Well, the merchant service provider gets a little bit extra of that money because if they have – if that card actually does get charged back, they have to spend their time actually going in and researching it and everything and calling the, the merchant and all that. So they take that little slice out. So believe it or not, even though you see these echo terminals and transfer ADs and they're all owned by banks, they're not 100% compliant with their own regulations. You know, if a hotel, you have to put rooms, room number that was stayed in, the in folio or invoice number of that room. You know, these terminals can't accept that information, and that information actually gives you better discount information. And they know that. They don't care. They're just like, well, if it's not fully compliant, it just means we're going to get more money off the top. And it's the same philosophy, you know. It's like, well, we can push that, but, you know, they make more money on a trans 380 than they do on a credit card network solution, you know. Because it's like, well, I'm just going to bump the price out. Before they were on eBay, you know, they were charging, you know, for this little box you can get on eBay for 50 bucks, you know, the... Uh, what is it, the uh, Hypercom one, I believe, they have on there? It's 50 bucks, but, you know, three years ago it was $400 from your merchant service provider, and they're taking a, a uh, $250 um, straight off the top profit off that. Yes? What about, uh, did you kind of directly add, like, a lot of those spam going around? We can tell you that the super, you know, super, it's kind of cheap merchant account. Yeah, the, those. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, the actual line of it, it can be up to about, I believe, five different people who touch your money before your your bank, before the merchant bank will. Because yeah, authorization. The way it works is when you swipe the card, it goes to the front end processor. The front end processor then passes it on to the merchant service provider. Merchant service provider then either passes it on to their little sub merchant per 
they'll have like emergency service provider and then their master one so they can double dip, you know, kind of like the electricity industry. And then it goes to the uh, issuing bank. Issuing bank then spits out a six digit auth code and it comes back to that line. Then when it gets cleared at the end of the night and they close out their terminal, it goes to the uh, front end processor says, hey, close my account. So then front end processor tells the merchant service provider, hey, close everything out of their account. So then it actually removes all the money out of them, then moves it to the front end processor. And the front end processor moves it to another back end processor. And the back end merchant service processor puts it into the merchant's account. So it actually goes across that line. Now, the people on this end who say, I can give you a really great deal, these are what I was talking about, those shysty people out in the, uh, in the, um, merchant service business, you know, they're just like, and they're not going to even give you a good deal. They're going to take people who have know nothing about it and just, you know, screw them left and right with fees. Yeah, in all honesty, um, 50 percent of Visa charges that go through don't even talk to Visa. They just have a logo and, and the bank pays a royalty to Visa for carrying that logo. You know, and you know they make a lot of, they like make a lot of money off that. You know, um, the only one that actually does have a lot of transactions moving through is Mastercard. And I think they have like six Master Banks that they like Wells Fargo and a couple others that actually carry the Mastercard logo. And they actually store a lot of their data there because they give them data mining purposes for it. They actually have the right to give to all of their issuing banks uh, information in groups of like general trend trends. Yeah. Aloha is on ASCII. Um, that's all I'll say on that one. Yeah. Just go to eBay and type in uh, Omni395. How did he get it? Um, these, they don't care. They don't, there's no regulation on who's allowed to get these terminals. If you're a customer that wants to buy one of these from us, we're going we're to sell it to you. You'll sell it to anybody. You, 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 don't, you don't care who it is. You don't need a little certificate saying I'm an MSP. Yes, sir, in the back. I'm sorry, what? I'm not in, informed on that, so I, don't, I couldn't tell you. Yes, sir. How do chargebacks work? Um, generally speaking, uh, what happens is when somebody sees something on their statement that they don't agree with, that they think somebody fraudulently took, what they'll do is they'll call their issuing bank to start it and say, hey, there's a charge on here that's not mine. And then the issuing bank will then in turn initiate a call with the merchant service provider. And they'll say, hey, we have your merchant here. It says that he wasn't charged it. So then the merchant service provider will then contact directly the merchant and they'll say, we need your records for this particular client. We need to see a signed receipt. We need to see, um, you know, your closeout batch on this. And we need to compare this to their general signatures of uh, this client of this issuing bank. And they have to go through this big, huge fiasco. And the thing with, uh, with credit card networks is they make chargebacks simpler in that aspect because it's all stored on computers and whatnot. So all you have to do is type in a credit card number and it pops up their signature, you know, you're seeing electronic signature pads now, that gives them a better discount rate because it's easier for them to pull it up. They don't have to go through a huge two-year box of receipts to find it. So that's generally how chargebacks work. Um, I couldn't tell you the actual little details on it. I deal mostly with uh, the merchants and the <laughs> uh, I couldn't. Yes, sir. Uh, PayPal actually has a quasi credit card network. They um, have their own. They have their own master merchant, and what they do is they have all their clients go into their master merchant, and that master merchant then gets authorized. It gets an ID tag, from what I understand. Uh, anybody from PayPal, go ahead and shoot me if I'm wrong. Um, it goes through there, and then it just goes to uh, front end processor, just like anybody else. Some people would say they're front end processors, like PayPal, but they're actually still going through a front end processor. Well. Well, they're a bank, but they still have to. They still. They still. They still have to go through a um, front-end processor, just like any other bank. So, if they have their own front-end processor, they have their own, but they still have to go through it, and it still has to be a separate ent entity. So.
Right, yeah, and X and all that. Uh, is there any others? I believe I'm just about out of time. I'll take one last question. Okay. I know that um, people have partnerships with each other, like generally speaking, like Sears and a couple of their other, because Sears has their own clearinghouse as well. They would they work with other businesses as well, having similar blacklists. But for all intents and purposes, there really isn't. The whole point is is that the credit card industry it seems robust and secure, and it's not. It's just plain old not. That nobody knows what the other guy's doing, and you know it's just free reign. And people wonder why you know card terminals are getting cloned and people are stealing credit cards and. And uh, not the second one, but the first data place got gibbed. You know, everybody read about that where, you know, five or six million uh, credit cards were just taken off the Internet. Yeah, it's just not there as far as security. Yes? Okay, I, I can't answer that one. If you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I'd love that. He's giving me a signal to clear everybody out. Uh, thank you very much to those who stuck around. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and apparently there's one other guy at the con with his shirt, so if you see me and you have more questions, just come flag me down. <laughs>